Just want to welcome everybody in person and online, and so we're just going to we're just going to jump right into Matt's message. Just want to stay in the spirit of uh, worship that we've just experienced. So, anyway, Matt, just go ahead and just share what's on your heart. Sorry about that. I blame the Lord, actually. I've just spent the last 20 minutes sitting there and shaking under the power of the anointing. So if, if I look a little bit wobbly, and my hands wobble, I don't have Parkinson's disease. I've just been feeling the anointing of the Lord. Well, it's great to be back with you all again. Um, if you've seen uh, the write-up of this talk on uh, YouTube, Brian helpfully called it The Lion and the Lamb, part one. So uh, you don't need the brains of an archbishop, as we say in the UK, to work out that this talk might be the lion and the lamb, part two. Um, so last week I really did feel compelled to uh, challenge a spirit that's abroad in this world right now of anti-Semitism, and um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to, to challenge that and to, to address that issue. Um, Today, I, I'm going to be talking about the nature of the lamb, the lamb nature of, of Christ. Um, but before I do that, let's just have a, a quick reminder of the passage that I was using as my theme text, which was Revelation 5. And if you've got your Bibles, feel free to turn to Revelation 5. Last time I was looking, by way of a quick recapitulation, at the nature of Jesus as the line of the tribe of Judah. And uh, those, those of us who've studied the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1 know that Jesus is of the tribe of Judah. And you can clearly see the genealogy of Jesus through Judah, through David. Uh, and ultimately, we know him as our Messiah promise to the Jewish people and the promise to all of mankind. So I want to start tonight, today by looking at verse 6, Revelation 5 and verse 6. It's this very simple statement. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the scroll, on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Well, Leave it there for now. So last week, we were looking at how only the lion of the tribe of Judah was worthy to open this scroll. And David weeps because he doesn't know until that point who is going to be worthy to open the scroll. But then there's this incredible revelation as he's watching the lion of the tribe of Judah. He just says, then I saw a lamb. And there's this Amazing contradiction in the nature of Christ. You can never pin God down into one nature or another. God is far more complex than our ability to, to, to understand. And so just as he sees this incredible revelation and he sees Jesus revealed as this warrior, this warrior king in the tribe of Judah, as a Jewish warrior king, he keeps looking and then he sees the eternal nature of Christ in a different form which is the nature of the lamb, the lamb who'd been slain, the lamb who had willingly given up his life so that we might enter into the fullness of everything that God has for us. It's not either or, it's both. He is a warrior on one hand, 
he is a slain lamb on the other. How can that be? How can a warrior also be a lamb who's willing to die? You, you might say, not a great warrior if you're so willing to die. Surely a warrior should stay alive and should, and should fight and to take the, should, should kill the enemy. I mean, after all, a good battle is one that you win. So I'm just going to leave that thought hanging there. A um, little bit about me, because um, it'll explain a bit about what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so I've spent nearly my whole career, um, some 30 years, working for the British military. So um, I, I, I'm something of an expert, I guess, in uh, strategy, planning, military concepts, um, planning military capabilities. Um, you might all have views as to whether that's something a Christian should be doing, but that is the, that is the walk that God has, has given me to, to, to walk and to be a witness um, within um, the British government and also um, within the US government. So I've worked in the Pentagon. Um, uh, I spent two years there working on Donald Rumsfeld's uh, personal staffs in, in what's known as OSD, the Office of the Secretary of Defense. So I do know a little bit about um, what I'm going to talk about. And what I want to talk about is readiness. Readiness. Um, but I'm not just going to stick to readiness. So I'm going to talk about what I'm going to call three R's. Now, I don't know if in um, US education you talk about the three R's still. No, does that mean anything? Raise a hand if you know what I mean by the three R's. No. OK, so when I was, when I was growing up in 1970s Britain, um, people talked about the three R's in education, which was a basic education, which was reading, writing, and arithmetic. Now, quite, that, quite why that started with an R, when it obviously starts with an A, I don't know. I always found that funny. But the three R's were reading, writing, and arithmetic. Um, so, um, and that was seen to be the basics of, a, of, of an education. Um, I mean, maybe we could go back to that. Uh, but uh, my three R's are going to be readiness, resemblance, and ruling and reigning, and that's four R's. <laughs> Readiness, resemblance, and ruling and reigning. But let's call it three R's, just to stick to three R's, because I think it's more, more memorable. Um, now, I'm aware it's Veterans Day weekend. Any veterans, any veterans in the house? Amen. Thank you, Thank you brother. Um, you know, freedom is not free, and anyone who's served in uniform um, has made... Uh, sacrifices, their families made sacrifices, um, they've been to places um, maybe they didn't want to go to. Um, and uh, something I love about Americans, and as I say, I've, I've worked with Americans, whenever I've turned up in um, the most unpleasant corners of the world, there's almost always been an American standing at the bar waiting to uh, make friends with me. Um, and uh, and I, I love the fact that um, the, the Brits and the Americans, we stand together in, in pretty much all the wars that we fight. Um, we're normally there shoulder to shoulder. Um, I can say honestly as a, as a British military planner that um, I mean, we, just, we just couldn't do it without you. Um, we're very much Robin to your Batman. Um, and uh, we take our lead often from, from what the US do. Not because we're some sort of slave to American policy, uh, but, but genuinely, we do see the world often in very similar ways. Um, and so when the UK decides to act, normally we find the, the US has decided to act in the same way. And I, I do genuinely believe that's because we're freedom-loving nations. Um, we, share, um, we share a love of democracy, and we're, prepared, we're ultimately prepared to, um, to spend blood and treasure to, to, to defend those rights and those freedoms. So, um, you know, if it wasn't for the U.S. armed forces, I might be standing here talking to you in German now, certainly with a heavily German accent. Um, not that I've got anything against the Germans, but I, I, I don't like the Nazis very much, and I'm, I'm glad they didn't invade my country in, in 1940. Why, why am I saying all of this? Um, it's a bit of an odd introduction, isn't it? Um, you know, our nations don't like tyrants, and I believe there is a divine call upon my nation and happy to talk about that at length if anyone wants to talk about it. I can point to a series of tyrants who've come against um, Britain over the last, well, 2,000 years. That, that, that certainly in the last 1,000 years, we've, we have fought off. And there is a, there's a divine call upon this nation, the United States, to fight tyrants around the world. And I have not given up my belief that um, our two nations will not once again lock arms 
and face down the Antichrist system. So I believe that. I believe that we can pray for that. And, uh, and I'm certainly standing here as a, as a member of the remnant from the United Kingdom to say uh, we need you to stand with us like you did before. And uh, my prayer is that we will stand with you, that there will be at least two nations who will uh, take a stand um, against the Antichrist system that's coming. You know, we've done a good job, I think, of fighting off the tyrants. We've stood, we've faced off in recent uh, decades Saddam Hussein, Adolf Hitler, Joe Stalin, going back a little bit further. Uh, we faced down Napoleon in, in the UK. And I have to say, with some humility, that uh, the people of the United States faced down a tyrant of uh, King George III, who was a British tyrant. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, so you know, the, the worst tyrant the world's ever going to face is, is still lying ahead of us, unfortunately. All of the rest um, of the tyrants were, were types and shadows. We can study history, we can look. Um, at the example of, of great leaders. Um, we can look at the example of great prayer warriors. Um, and those are good, those are good um, examples for us to look at. But what is coming, um, it's our generation that's going to face that, I believe. I believe that's our generation. This is what we've been born into the kingdom to face. Um, our predecessors, our grandfathers um, faced Hitler, um, it's our generation, I believe, that will face the greatest tyrant that's ever going to walk the, walk the earth. Um, and we can only do that in the power of, power, of, um, power of God. And we can only do that if uh, we stand on the word and we understand all of the warnings and all of the guidance that we've been given. There's, been, there's more said about the times that we're coming into in this Bible than any other uh, stage of history, including the time when Jesus walked the earth. So we are not left alone. And uh, I believe that uh, when we come into those times, um, those of us who are vigilant, who are watching and have that watchman anointing, will almost be ticking off, yep, that's happened, that's happened, that's happened. And the body of Christ will be aware. We will not be, um, we will not be ignorant, for those of us who are watching and waiting. There's a very interesting um, group of people um, that you can see in Matthew 25. Now, this, is, this, is, this, is, uh, this will be a very familiar passage. It's the passage of the wise and foolish virgins. And rightly, you know, when we're in Sunday school um, or when we're being taught in church, um, I won't go through it. It should be a, a very familiar a parable to all of us. Um, rightly, we're exhorted to be those wise those wise virgins, the ones with oil, um, the ones with oil in their lamp. And I always find it very sobering that uh, when the foolish uh, virgins come to the wise ones and say, give us your oil, our lamps are going out, they're commended for saying no. It's not interesting. You'd think, wouldn't you, that, that if, if you're full of the Holy Spirit and you're really walking with the Lord and you're strong and you're watching and waiting, um, when that time comes... Um, when someone comes to you and says, give me some of your oil, you, you would think it would just be a nice thing to say, oh yeah, have some of my oil. That's, but that's, that's not what they were, that's not what happens here. Um, you've got to be ready. You've got to get yourself ready. I, I can't be full of the oil for you, or for you, or for you. And you can't be full of the oil, and I can't expect just to drink from, from that when that time comes. We are all responsible for making ourselves ready. Um, and I, I find that very hard. Um, to, because my natural inclination is to be generous and to give and to give what I have, um, give what I have to others. But there is a, there is a real sense in what uh, we're being encouraged here, which is we've got to make ourselves ready. Um, I can't make you ready. You can't make me ready. But actually, um, that's a little bit of a, an aside. What I wanted to, to look at in this passage um, is a third category of people that I think is often missed. And you can, you can read about that in Matthew 25 and verse 6. So the, the verse before says, The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. All. Notice that? The wise virgins and the foolish virgins all became drowsy and fell asleep. And at midnight the cry rang out, 
Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Who says that? That's the third category of people, isn't it? Even the wise virgins at this stage are drowsy and asleep. So who are these people? Who are these people saying, here's the bridegroom, come out and meet him? And uh, we know that's the friends of the bridegroom. And my challenge to you and, and to myself and to anyone who's listening is let's just not aim to be the wise virgin. Let's aim, let's aim to be that third category. Let's aim to be those watchmen, those friends of the bridegroom who are so close to the Lord, we're not just watching and waiting for him, we're traveling with him. We know his timings. We know he's coming. We've got that strong voice that we're calling out into that dark void. We're calling out to the wise virgins. We're calling out to, what, to warn the foolish virgins. That's what it looks like to be ready, that you're a friend of the bridegroom. And so let's try and couple those two themes in our head. Friends of the bridegroom are the ones who are ready. They're the ones who are giving that proclamation that Lord's coming. We know he's coming because we have his heart, because we're his friend, because we're traveling closely with him. Um, and we're responsible. We're responsible for waking people up, for encouraging them. You know, there are lots of people who are asleep. But all of these uh, virgins are, are Christians. It's not, this isn't the world we're talking about. They're, they're the virgins, as Brian says. They're the, they're the ones who've kept themselves pure in, in that sense. So even the ones who are, f you know, there's a category then, isn't there? Even people who are filled with the Holy Spirit and who love the Lord, they're still asleep. There are people out there who love the Lord, but they're still asleep to the, the times that, that uh, we're living in and to the actual, on, the, on point, timing of the, of the bridegroom. Okay, let's look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 11. Very similar theme. So I'm going to really hit this theme of readiness, my first R. I love this passage. I love all, the, I love all of Paul's writings, but 1 Thessalonians has been a, a friend to me for, ever since I became a believer. Now, brothers, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Just remember what we were looking at in the parable of the wise and foolish. These are Christians who are asleep. These are wise virgins who, are, who need waking up. But you, brothers, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing and it's particularly those verses 5 to 8 that uh, I'm really interested in today. You are all sons of the light. Let's not be like others who are asleep. And then there's something quite military, I think. Put on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. So there's an element of readiness which has military overtones about putting on armor, putting on that helmet putting on that shield, that, that, that breastplate. I couldn't help myself, I'm afraid, but um, have a bit of a think about readiness. You know, readiness is a, is a very important element of military capability. 
So, uh, as I say, I couldn't help myself, but I did a, did a little bit of homework. And uh, I had a look at the US Army Readiness Guidance Manual, which you can find online. For, for military geeks like me, uh, it's, it's a, quite an interesting read. And um, so the definition of military readiness, according to this guidance manual, uh, military readiness is the military's capacity to engage in combat and fulfill assigned missions and tasks. Let me read that again. The military's capacity to engage in combat and fulfill assigned missions and tasks. And there are four pillars uh, to readiness, according to the US Army Readiness Guidance Manual. And they are uh, manning, which is another way of describing personnel, so having the right people in the right roles. Uh, number two is training, making sure that uh, you, you actually um, know what you're doing, and you, you know that the people around you, they know what they're doing and you're safe. When they've, that they've got your back because they're competent with the equipment that they're using, competent that, that when they, to carry out orders. The third one is equipping, equipping, and the fourth is leadership development. You know, we can learn a lot in the church from looking at how armies organise themselves. Um, U.S. Army is the best army in the world. I don't don't mind admitting that. Um, U.S. Army has a, 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 a saying which, which I like a lot, which is, train hard, fight easy. It's good, isn't it? Train hard, fight easy. You know, you, 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 you make sure your people, you know, you think of that U.S. Marine guy, you know, they look, hair's like this, isn't it? You know, razor hair and great bodies. Um, <laughs> they're strong, they look the part. You know, I, 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 I've spent enough of my time around the military that I can just walk into a barracks, I can just walk into a unit, I can see whether they're going to they're fight or not. They, they just look right. They just, the uniform looks right, the buttons are done right, they hold themselves right, they're strong backs, um, the, the boots look good. You know, you can see, you can see from that attention to detail that these people are going to fight. Now, when you actually go into a fight, you're not there in your ceremonial uniform, but the, what... The, what you learn in looking after yourselves and preparing yourselves and looking after your, your fellow soldiers, um, you carry that, you carry that, you carry that into the battle. So train hard, fight easy. I think there's some principles that we um, as the church need to learn as we're moving into these end times. You know, many churches um, like to call themselves, I don't know, Marietta Family Church or, or um, Atlanta Community Church or, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about family in the church, and that's wonderful. There, there is a place for family in the church. I absolutely have benefited so much from, from um, parents in Christ who've mentored me, particularly as a young believer. There was a particular uh, couple, a married couple, who really mentored me and really helped me to make the transition from growing up in the world to being a, 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 a man of God. And I'm so grateful for that family role, that sense when you're hurting, there are people who come around you and, and love on you. And there is a place absolutely for the church to be the family. I think we're much less good at understanding what does it mean for the church to be an army. You know, what, is, what, is it, what does it look like if um, the Archangel Michael turns up with his, uh, his recruiting sergeant and calls you all into the battle? Are you ready? Are you trained up? Do you trust the guy behind that he knows how to fire his weapon, so to speak, which is the word of God? Do you, do you know that the person to your left has got a shield that's going to take that blow that comes in from the left and the person on the right has got their sword out and is going to attack the enemy that's coming at you from the right? I just leave that, I leave that there as, a, as, a, as an open question. And the third element of readiness was equipment. You know, I believe that's the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, the ability to, uh, to see the enemy's plans, the ability to know the command of, the, uh, of, of, the, of our general, the Lord of hosts, the lion of the tribe of Judah, our military general. 
And the last of those four elements of readiness from the US manual is leadership development. You know, are we developing our people? Are we providing opportunities for people to lead? Are we challenging someone to maybe take that cell group or to, or to lead the prayer meeting? What are we, how are we building up our people to become the leaders of, of, leaders of the future? And how are we taking today's leaders and taking them from being a major to being a general? You know, I, I, my heart is broken, along, I know, with Brian and others. Um, the body of Christ has, has lost a general this month in Mike Bickle. You know, we need our generals in, 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 in the church. I, I, pray that, I pray that this can be resolved and might can be restored. But, um, but who's God raising up in his place? There aren't many generals in the body of Christ. Are we praying for God to raise up new generals? We, we need them. Something about um, readiness is that uh, you cannot be high readiness all the time. So I'll talk about the, um, what I know, which is how British military organise. We have a number of what we call force elements. So those are particular military unit, units um, who are at high readiness. So, for example, if you're a um, fighter jet pilot, if you're at the highest level of readiness, you, you go to... You, you, don't even go to bed at night. You, you wear your um, flying suit, your mask. Um, you, you're allowed to sit in a chair, but you're right by uh, where you have to run onto the, um, onto the runway so that you can get your plane up in about five minutes That's that, if you're in high readiness. Um, it's hard work because um, you don't get a proper night's sleep. It's, these you, these um, flying suits are pretty uncomfortable to wear. Um, you, you, you have to be... Uh, able to get into that plane, which means that the guys who fuel it up, the plane has to be fueled up. Um, everyone, everyone who's responsible for getting that plane up, the guy in the, the guy who uh, the, the air traffic controller, they all have to be ready to go to get that plane up. Um, whilst we are all sleeping peacefully in our bed, um, you have people in the U.S. Air Force who are sitting in those uncomfortable chairs in their rubbers because of, uh, there's another 9/11. You want the F-16 in the, in the, in, up in the air pretty fast, and, and we have the same situation. Um, at at the, uh, the military, in the army level, um, we have something called the Spearhead Battalion, who are the highest readiness troops. So if you're in the Spearhead Battalion, you have to be, uh, your notice to move is less than one hour. So that means you're in barracks, or you're within five to ten minutes of barracks. The equipment's, again, all, all fueled up. Um, all of the uh, ammunition is ready to go, or loaded up. So if, you, um, if there's a particular uh, terrorist attack or something like that, you're the unit, you're notified, you're the ones who have to go. So you, you're, you're not having leave that, that month if you're the spearhead battalion um, and so on. And it's all good militaries have this. You cannot stay at high readiness all the time. And so that task is moved around between different people. So... You're on a rotor, essentially, if you're the fighter jet pilot. Um, you, when you're not in high readiness, of course, you can go home, you can see your family, you can even take three weeks' leave, if, and so on, when you're in the lower levels of readiness. But your time, will, your turn will come back again. So again, this is a principle I, I just want to sh share with you. You don't all have to be high readiness all the time to be a church that fights like an army, but somebody needs to be. Somebody needs to be high, high, high vigilance. So... Um, there's a crisis in a particular family. Um, let's just sort of bring this back into the family context. How are you going to pray for that person? Who's going to... Someone needs to pray through the night because there's a sick child in a hospital. Um, who's, who's on point to do that? Who's your spearhead? Who's your spearhead battalion? Who's your fast jet pilot? Um, I think we're moving into times where we need to think a bit more like this. And uh, it's great to be a family. It's, it's relaxed. It's comfortable. We go out for meals. We kick back, watch a game together, that's great. I, I, nothing against that. But if you need to move into that warfare mode, if you need to move into an army mode, um, are you trained? Are you ready to go? Do you have the leaders coming through the ranks who can, who can take this forward? Um, so...
same principle of high readiness is um, who is watching for that enemy attack. You know, the, uh, the military have a whole variety of different sensors. You have radar. You have uh, a whole variety of intelligence um, assets that you're, that, uh, that you're using all the time. You're, you're always sweeping that environment. And the greater the threat becomes, the more assets you get up and the more effort you put into uh, looking, uh, looking for that, uh, that threat. Um, find, fix, and fight are the three Fs that are often used to describe that. Find that threat, fix on it, work out what you're going to do with it, and then work out how you're going to attack it. Now, I'm not the first one to come up with this as an idea. So, as you'd expect, our brother Paul, many years ago, came up with just the same idea. You can read that in 2 Timothy 2, 3 to 4. 2 Timothy 2, 3 to 4. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commander. I quite like the way the new King, King James Version puts it. No one entangled, sorry, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. You know, we've all been enlisted as a soldier. There's a time to be a family. There's a time to be on low readiness, to be relaxing with our families. But there's also a time to be on high readiness where you're aware that you are that spearhead. You are uh, the ones who God is calling to take ground or to be vigilant or to um, defend your nation or your family or your friends from attack. Okay, that's, re that's resilience. I can all, you can all take a breath. Let's do uh, resemblance, which was my second R. And who is it that we're supposed to be resembling? So that's back to Revelation 5. Now, there's a very important principle uh, in the Bible when it comes to marriage. And you can read about it in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 14. Uh, where again, Paul says we must be equally yoked. Now, a yoke is the, uh, the piece of wood that sits over the shoulders of, of the oxen. So when you're plowing, plowing the ground back in those biblical times, you'd need to make sure that the two oxen were the same size, more or less, had the same strength, because if you had a really strong one, it, they just, you'd just go in circles. Um, so you need to make sure that those two oxen pull the same sort of weight so that you can put, you can put straight lines in whilst you're, you're ploughing. Or indeed whilst you're moving your cart around um, if you're being pulled by oxen. So that's, that's, the, that's the imagery of the day that Paul's using. Um, but within marriage, of course, um, it's an important principle too. You know, it's really important to be equally yoked with um, your life partner that God has given you to... Uh, you to share that same love of God together. It's, it's so much harder, isn't it, if as believers we're not married to another believer and, and we've all got, I'm sure, life experiences of where things have gone, gone wrong for people because they weren't equally yoked. They weren't seeing the same purposes of God uh, in their lives together. And that principle, if, it's, um, if it applies to our, our, our marriages in this life, are all the more important for how we, as the bride, relate to our bridegroom. Yes? If we're going to be equally yoked in, as the bride of Christ, which I believe we're all called to be. We're all called to be in the bride of Christ, but we all have to make a choice to be equally yoked. So back in Revelation 5, Paul has the, sorry, John has this Amazing revelation in the midst of seeing the Lion of Judah 
He says in verse 6, Then I saw a lamb. And if you have time, I'm not going to go through every passage, but uh, I can, I can, there are numerous, uh, numerous references in the book of Revelation, starting at about this point, but it then goes on. So Revelation 5 and 6, we've just looked at. Revelation 5 and 9 again. The four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. And then in 13, I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and orders in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And it goes on, 6, 16, 7, 9, 7, 17, I'll uh, read out too. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their, ear, from their eyes. So here we are in the book of Revelation, the revelation given by Christ, his revelation given to John, about the last seven years, essentially. And Jesus is being revealed as the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he's being revealed as the lamb, the eternal lamb that was slain. So we, those of us who are going to be living through this, uh, this, this, this final stage and as we're moving into it, if we're going to be equally yoked, if we're going to be the bride making herself ready, how are we going to make ourselves ready? What does this readiness look like? Who is it that we're making? Who is it that we're revealing? Who is it that we're making ourselves ready? If we're going to be equally yoked, I believe we need to be resembling the lion of the tribe of Judah and the lamb. Does that make sense? We're going to be equally yoked to our bridegroom. How is our bridegroom being revealed in the book of Revelation as the lion of the tribe of Judah? And as the lamb, as the lamb, the eternal lamb. So we see that in readiness, readiness, military readiness, at, at one important level, the lion, the readiness of the lion, learning how to fight, learning how to, um, learning how to train, learning how to um, be, be ready. But as the lamb, sacrificial, laying down our lives, laying down our will, living in the spirit and not in our soul, becoming equally yoked with the bridegroom, so his will. As a military commander, yes, as the lion, as a military commander, but as a lover, as a bride. You know, it's a lot easier for us guys to be, do the warrior bit, you know. Maybe it's easier for you ladies to do the bride bit. But guys, you've got to learn to be the bride. Ladies, you've got to learn to be the warrior. Um, but we can also do that corporately because remember that key principle of readiness? One person doesn't have to do it all the time. As an army, you take your turn. You have different roles, you have different missions, you have different um, assignments, you have different levels of hierarchy. So let's learn how to do it together. Let's corporately, you know, Lord's Prayer, we pray to our Father, not my Father, our Father. Let's work together. Let's learn how to do this together. You know, I believe that the nature of the lamb in particular will be revealed to us and it will be revealed to the earth through us. Now that's pretty scary. You know, I like the fighting bit. I like a fight. You know, I, I, I feel that's, that's my comfort zone, um, organising others and myself to, to put a good fight together. Um, it is not my comfort zone to lay down my life for um, my friends. Um, all of us, I think, want to believe that you know, we're going to live forever here. Uh, none of us want to think that we might be the ones called to martyrdom. The 
This is going to be the final test, I think, for the whole body of Christ as we uh, make ourselves ready, as we um, take on the nature of the Lamb. The way we demonstrate to this world that we are equally yoked as his kind, that we're equally yoked, that we truly have made ourselves ready, is when the nature of the Lamb is start, starts to be made known uh, in the uh, in the world through us and so that lamb nature is readiness the more ready we are you'll be able to tell that you know different readiness levels from you know one to ten if you like um, the more you start to see the nature of the lamb in the body of Christ and the world sees us they'll see the Lord in us as lamb There's also something very interesting, as, and I'm starting to think a little bit about ruling and reigning here. Jesus will return as judge. He will return uh, as judge to judge the good from the bad, the mediocre from the, the great in our lives and in the world. But he will, he will return as lamb to judge. It's as lamb that he has the right to judge because there's nothing that he hasn't been through himself. And if we're going to be ruling and reigning with him, it will be as lamb that we rule and reign with him. It's as lamb that we move as warriors. It's with that broken heart for the world. It's with that willingness to lay down our lives that we have the right to fight. We're not fighting just for ourselves. We're not fighting just to be rich. We're not fighting just so that our families get, get an easy ride. Um, it's, we're fighting in the nature of Christ. And it's a, a fantastic training program. I mean, this is just the beginning. You know, I know it feels like the end of all things. And in some ways, you know, the book of Revelation kind of ends with the, the great tribulation and we're all dreading this terrible time. But that's, that's, that's just the final, um, the final course in our curriculum, if you like. That's the final course um, before we move into this whole new world where Jesus himself returns and the king of the kingdom is here to rule and reign. And uh, we're doing it with him and for him and on his behalf. It's very interesting to do a quick Bible study, and I um, commend it, the, um, the use of the term iron rod or iron scepter. And uh, if, if you fancy a bit of homework for this week, I'd, I'd suggest just get, get your Bible study out and, and think, just Google iron scepter or iron rod. It's the same, it's the same word in the original Greek. Um, in King James Version, it talks about an iron rod the NIV that, <coughs> excuse me, that I tend to use talks about an iron scepter. I prefer scepter because a scepter is the, uh, if you like, the rod that the king holds. So if you think of the recent coronation of King Charles in my country, he was handed an orb in his left arm, which is a circle with a cross on it, which symbolizes the Christ being the king of the earth, which I think is a nice, nice symbol. And then he carries a scepter, which is handed to his right hand, his right arm's peaks of strength, which is a rod, which is a symbol of authority. Again, in the UK, the crown jewels have, have a cross over the top to symbolize Christ's authority. It's good that we still have some of this symbol, symbology in my country. So the first reference, I think, of interest, and I'm sure you've still got Revelation 2 open, Revelation open, but Revelation 2 Verse 26, and this is to the letter to the church in Thyatira. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. I find this so exciting. He, that is Christ, will rule them with an iron scepter. He will dash them to pieces like pottery. Amen. So this symbol is of Christ. Ruling, ruling with an iron scepter, an iron rod. 
And anyone who uh, opposes him, he will dash them to pieces like pottery. This is, this is again, this is military. You know, this millennium era that's coming, it's not too far away now, Jesus Christ will rule with an iron rod. That's, that's the imagery. There's going to be no um, rebellion for those thousand years. And our task, if we're privileged to, uh, to, to be included, will be to support him in this in this ruling and reigning with an iron rod. This isn't going to be the democracy that our nations love. <laughs> this is going to be a kingdom. Amen? But, but not by a tyrant, by the most loving, gracious, omnipotent, uh, omniscient God who has the right to reign. Satan tried to offer him a deal and he wouldn't take it. He knew his time was coming. Satan offered him, Satan offered him in the uh, temptation all of the kingdoms of the earth and took him up to a high point and said, this can all be yours. But I think he just thought, I, I'll wait till it's my turn. I don't need you to offer me this. I'll do it when it's, when it's my turn to do it. And he just, he, he, uh, his, turn, his time is coming soon. And then Revelation 12 and 5. Another passage I know you know well in this church. This is the, uh, the man-child, but just a quick five. She gave birth to a son, a, a man-child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. Don't have time to talk about who the man-child is, but just notice all the nations are going to be ruled with an iron scepter, a symbol of the authority of the king. And then Revelation 19, verse 15. You guessed it. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So those of us who qualify, um, I don't take for granted at all, but uh, you know, I've, I've got to keep going to the end and so have you <laughs> to qualify. But that promise is there. He is going to be ruling with an iron scepter and I want to see him do it. I want to be there when he does it. And I want, to, I want to be using this time now to be training, to be making myself ready, to be that leaders under development. Remember those four principles of the US military readiness guidance? They've got something there. Readiness, training, manning the right people in the right places at the right time, and equipping, being equipped. Those are the principles that, uh, that, that are going to get us there. And Isaiah 9 and verse 6, the government will be on his shoulders and his kingdom will have no end. There is that promise. We can see that date where the kingdom will absolutely start on earth when the millennium reign starts. But it's already started. It's already started in our hearts. It's already started when we choose to align ourselves with his purposes and his plans. Um, and just, just a thought. Um, you know, if, if, there's, if there's one place on earth more than anywhere else where you can see God's kingdom operating, I believe it's in a Christian marriage. I believe it's when a man loves his wife like Christ loves the church and where godly woman loves her husband like the church loves, loves Christ. Is it any wonder that marriages are under such terrible attack? That even the definition of biblical definition of marriage between a man and a woman is even under attack? You know, this is, it's in our families, it's in our, it's as, we, as we fight for each other as husbands and wives and as families, that the kingdom is already starting, we're already witnessing, we're already showing something of, of, how, of how the kingdom is, is, is working. Um, because it's as a bridegroom that Christ is, is returning. 
and it's as a bride that will be ruling and reigning with him with that iron scepter. So I'm going to uh, sort of wrap that up with these three areas. Readiness. Are we ready? Am I ready? What would it look like if we were? Would it look different to how we are now? If, if, you can, if something just pops into your head, what would it look like if I was ready? What would it look like if Restoration Life was ready? If there's something that you can't look at right now and say, I'm ready, there's probably something that we need to do. There's probably something that I need to do. So what would it look like if you were ready? You know, if the Holy Spirit woke you up at 3 p.m. tonight and put someone on your heart, what would you do? Would you go back to sleep? Would you wake up and start praying for that person and posture yourself to hear more? I fear I might just go back to sleep. Um, but that's what readiness looks like, I think, as a starting point. And resemblance. You know, this week, those of us who are married, let's use this as an opportunity. How are we being shaped by the Holy Spirit to be the, be the bride of Christ? Husbands, are we loving our wives like Christ loved the church? Wives, are we loving our husband like the church is called to love Christ? Are there opportunities for the nature of the Lamb to be established? What about that difficult co-worker who's driving us nuts? Or that difficult boss who uh, is just so unfair? Um, we've all got those people in our lives. I call them, I call them grace growers. Because um, I'm the one who needs to grow a little bit of grace. And you know what? You could change your job. You could get another job. And the Lord will have a whole new lineup of grace growers waiting for you in your next job. Let's not make him do that. Maybe just uh, ask for a bit of grace to deal with the people that he's put in our lives right now. Here's a chance to show them the nature of the Lamb because they're not probably going to see it any, from anybody else this week. You know, God's really interested in uh, how we treat the people around us. It's of eternal value. That's the point I'm trying to make here. As we, a little bit more of the lamb can come through in us this week. If this much more of the lamb can be shown in my life this week, I'm just that little bit more ready. And if enough of us have a little bit more of the lamb in us this week, and the week after, and the week after, and the week after, and it starts to consolidate, the whole church is starting to get, is starting to get ready. The bride's making herself ready. Amen. It's in, those, it's in those relationships, your spouse, your kids, the teachers at school, classmates. It really does matter. It has eternal value. And resilience. You know, let's persist in prayer uh, for that loved one who is still resistant to God. Let's, let's continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem as, as, as we did in the worship there. You, you never get to stop praying for that, that we're going to be praying for the peace of Jerusalem until Jesus returns. There is some resilience. We've got to keep going here. So let's pray without ceasing, as the Bible tells us. And uh, last, and all, last of all, I think, um, one final military term for you, which is your T-A-O-R your tactical area of operational responsibility. Your T-A-O-R. If you remember nothing else, remember this. You know, we're not all called on our own to win the battle and bring Jesus back. We're going to do it together. We're going to make ourselves ready together. There is going to be a faithful remnant. You know, much like Elijah was shown, there's 7,000 out there. You've never, you've never heard of me until, you know, this week. But I'm out there. I never heard of you until two, two weeks ago. But you're out there. You know, we do have each other. We do have a family. We do have others in the army. We don't have to win this war on our own. But 
in any army, everyone has different responsibilities. There's a guy whose job is to get fuel in the truck. There's a guy whose job is to be a sniper and to shoot straight, and he's picked because he can shoot straight. Um, there's someone who's spent a lot of time in leadership development, and they just depart. You, know, you just trust that they know what they're doing because they've got 30 or 40 years um, of experience behind them. Um, there's also someone you know, who's an intelligence guy sits there with their earphones on, a bit weird, you know. <laughs> yeah. Listening into the sonar, can see all the beeps on the radar and knows what, exactly what that means. And then there's that lunatic with the dagger between his knees, who, between his teeth, who, you know, goes straight at the enemy um, just when you need him to and takes, takes the risk with bravery. You know, we can all see those characters in the church around us, can't us? So let's Let's recognize each other. Let's encourage each other. Let's notice each other when we're doing that. Let's value each other's roles. So your tactical area of operational responsibility, you'll be given, you know, particular units will be given, you know, you're, you're going to take that town. You're going to hold that tree, sniper. You're going to sit in that church tower and you're going to watch and if the enemy comes, you're going you're to shoot straight. Well, your job is to make sure that the fuel is, is, is loaded up into, into that vehicle. So I don't know your tactical area of responsibility. Um, God does, and God can grow that. It might be, um, that, and in fact it is, everyone has a tactical area of responsibility for their family. If you're married, you have a tactical area of responsibility for your spouse, to pray for your spouse, to love your spouse, to care for your spouse, um, and for your children. If you're in a job, you have a tactical area of responsibility to pray for your co-workers, to watch for your co-workers. Um, and so on. So you, you, you can see your tactical air responsibility just by in terms of who God's given around you, the people that you have around you. But he wants to grow that because remember, leadership development is another key part of that. He needs to grow some generals. Everyone can't be a general, but we do need some. Everyone can't have that frontline ministry, but we do need some people who can do that. So let's ask God to show you what your role is, where he's wanting to stretch you, where he's wanting to put you. Um, and let's ask God also to raise up those generals because, as I say, we just lost one this month. So I'm going to close it there and I'm going to pray for us to know our tactical area of responsibility and uh, ask God to show all of us what that is. And if anyone wants prayer um, afterwards, if there's a particular issue that you're dealing with, something that's on your heart, um, a, a, a concern that you have, then... Uh, Let's, let's, let's pray for each other. Let's go to war. Let's go to battle. Let's bring, let's bring um, the Father's heart into our situation. And the line of Judah will turn up in our battle. Amen. So Jesus, Father, Holy Spirit, we need you. We need the Lion of Judah to turn up in this world. Yes, to defend, protect the beloved Jewish people, Lord, but to pretend, to defend and protect the beloved remnant. To raise up the generals who will lead us well. To, uh, to put that iron scepter into our hands so that we can start now to bring the authority of God into this world, into our marriages, into, into our places of work, into our schools. Father, I pray that uh, everyone here and everyone listening, you would show what is their tactical area of responsibility? What is their TAOR? What are you asking them to do? Who are the people that you've placed them with? How do you want them to pray? What do you want them to say? Lord, we can only do this if we're working according to your plan, your battle plan. And we, Lord, we recognize you as the ultimate commander-in-chief of the church. Thank you, Lord, that we're not alone. We have each other. And we have an army, a whole army of angels. And that day is coming where it says, the archangel Michael will stand up. That call will go out. It's time. All of heaven will be mobilized to invade this earth. And we want to be, we want to be there as those loyal foot soldiers fighting with you, fighting with the angels, equally yoked with the bridegroom.
so I'm going to leave it there. But if anyone, if there's an issue on anybody's heart and you would like me or Brian, Ken and the team to, to pray for that issue, then don't leave with a heavy heart today. Um, come, and, come and ask for prayer. And I'm sure we'll stand with you and prevail. Amen. Really, really good message, Matt. Thank you so much for sharing that. Very, very timely, very well spoken. And so we so appreciate that, Matt. And um, anyway, we're going to go ahead and just end the online portion right now. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us online. Have a blessed week. And uh, then for those who are here, um, what we want to do 